Let's wax about Talking Heads remaining light. Released October 8, 1980, Remain in Light is the fourth album from rock band Talking Heads, produced by Brian Eno. After finishing the tour in support of their third album, Fear of Music, the band took a break and focused either on other projects or focused on themselves. Frontman David Byrne teamed up with Fear of Music producer Brian Eno to make an experimental album entitled My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. Meanwhile, keyboardist Jerry Harrison went to Sigma Sound Studios to produce an album for former LaBelle singer Nona Hendrix. On the flip, there was a couple, drummer Chris France and bassist Tina Weymouth, who ventured to the Caribbean to ponder their marriage and their involvement in the band. Feeling the overt control of David Byrne, the couple was considering leaving the band. While on their trip, they pondered these things while participating in Haitian religious ceremonies and also practicing percussion of the region. Through socializing with Compass Point All-Star alum Sly and Robbie, the couple decided to buy an apartment directly above Compass Point Studios. Before long, Byrne and Harrison had joined the couple in Nassau. They had previously recorded their second album, More Songs About Buildings and Food, in 1978 at Compass Point. Realizing that the majority of their songs had been crafted around David Byrne's lyrics, the crew wanted a different type of vibe. They wanted to basically fabricate all the songs through the means of cooperation. Using e Zimbra as their basis point, they started to jam out instrumentals. After producer Eno joined them there, excited by what he heard from the jams, they began to focus on a blending of different genres. Heavily influenced by the Fela Kuti record Aphrodisiac, they set upon a synthesis of Afrobeat and African polyrhythms and textures alongside new wave rock and funk elements. Sensing and realizing the power of change in the burgeoning hip-hop scene, they began to jam instrumentals to tape, sectioning off pieces they liked, and then taking different snippets and looping them together in different configurations, creating the songs. Pretty standard business if you're working with computers today, but this was unheard of in 1980. There wasn't even a computer used for this process, only tape, skill, and ingenuity. Essentially, sampling before sampling. Genius. After the main grooves were looped, overdubs were added by trumpeter John Hassel and vocal overdubs from Nona Hendrix, as parts of the album were also recorded at Sigma Sound in New York based on the Hendrix-Harrison connection. The album really came together with the inclusion of ex-Zappa and Bowie guitarist Adrian Ballou, adding vocals and guitar solos utilizing the Roland GR300 guitar synthesizer. Initially trying to sing lyrics, David Byrne decided to try the automatopoeia style of writing, basically using rhythms instead of actual meanings of words, letting the words and the lyrics fill themselves in later. What came out of it was a new sort of rap half-sung style that was new to his own style. It had elements of hip-hop, it had elements of spoken word, and also elements of gospel preaching almost. All the cadences were there, and it proved to be a game-changer. Comprised of eight tracks, the record is a slice of new wave funk world music unheard of previously. With the tribal trance of Born Under Punches, the relentless funk of Cross-Eyed and Painless in The Great Curve, the driving beat questions of Once in a Lifetime, the stank of Houses in Motion, the trippy groove of Seen and Not Seen, the Middle Eastern mystique of The Listening Wind, and the ethereal darkness of The Overload. Quick story time! Allegedly, supposedly, the song The Overload was created to mimic what they considered the band Joy Division sounded like. And the kick of it all is that at this point, they had never heard what Joy Division sounded like at all. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but when the legend... Okay, back to it. The supporting tour would see the band expand to a nine-piece, including Adrian Ballou, Parliament Funkadelic keyboardist Bernie Worrell, percussionist Steven Scales, bassist Busta Cherry Jones, and vocalist Dolette McDonald. The tour garnered rave reviews of the unit, and the album would eventually go gold in 1985, then eventually selling over a million copies overall. Remain in Light would submit the band as an artistic pop force for many years to come. Released on the same day as one of my favorite records, Dirty Mind, I'd say that this record is equally as influential. Waxed!